So I'm uh, Kim Sakaryasen. I'm the fan club president of Dream Theater World. And uh, with me here now, we have Andy Sneep and Jimmy T. Meslin. So uh, what I was thinking we do now is just if, if each of you can introduce yourself a bit, like what's your background and how you got into this mess, as it were. Sure. Andy, you want to you want to take it? No, I'll let you take it. All right. All um. right. <laughs> uh, well, as you said, I'm Jimmy T. Uh, and as far as an introduction goes, keeping it Dream Theater related, you know, I've been I've been working with Dream Theater since about 2012 in different aspects. Uh, come time like 2017, 2018, I stepped more into an annual position, I guess you could say, where I'm with them on and off the road. Um, and I've worked with them as lead engineer on Distance Over Time and they're now uh, soon to be released record of you. And me, me, I, I'm the guy that mixed it basically. So <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm sort of late to the party really. I, I met John, I was over in New York um, playing, uh, it's gonna be two and a half years ago, something like that, three years ago, whenever. Uh, and John came out to one of the pre-shows that I was playing with. Um, and had a chat. I think he'd been using some of the software that I developed with ToonTrack, um, some of the drum software. So that's how he kind of knew me. Uh, and I met him after the show and we just got chatting and, you know, just general chit chat, after show chit chat. Uh, and we kept in touch. And then I got involved on John's solo album, um, sort of a year, a year and a half ago, whenever it was. Um, and I mixed that, uh, to, uh, that Jimmy had a track with him uh, uh, over there. Uh, and that went really well. Um, but we, you know, we kind of talked about maybe doing a Dream Theatre record a after that because we were really happy about the way it came out. But because of schedules and sort of me being away touring, we didn't, we didn't think it would work out. But then obviously when COVID happened, uh, everything changed um, and my schedule opened up. So that's how I got involved on, on this Dream Theatre record. And it, it, you know, it just timeline wise, it all worked out, didn't it? It, you know, all sort of fitted together well. Um, and, and we made it work. So that's how I got involved on this. Um, uh, and, it, you know, it just all worked out great schedule wise. What's funny uh, with the schedule thing is yours opened up for when this project was ready to mix and mine kind of shut down. It was, uh, it was like the day before delivery to mix that my wife went into labor and I and oh. I had a kid so it was like it's like the passing of the torch wasn't yeah it? exactly exactly <laughs> in you, many you ways this out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but no it's good because we, we'd obviously worked together um uh, and got a good rapport going and there's a few things on the the solo record where I was you know it was like oh okay, you know try this next time blah 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 and we, you know we, we were talking about equipment and gear um, so it, it really worked out well for this, didn't it? Because we, we obviously already knew each other. It was a good Absolutely. relationship with everyone. Um, yeah, yeah. So it was just, just seemed a very natural step to take. Um, no, it was really a case of, right, let's fit some keyboards and vocals into this idea, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Somewhere in there. Somewhere yeah. in there. Uh, so, go ahead. So, I'm what, sorry. What, what, so when you're starting a project like this, obviously you're doing everything in the studio. Jimmy, uh, but uh, w when are you involved, getting involved, Andy? Um, in pretty late on, really. Um, I mean, because we didn't know I was going to be mixing this um, because of the schedules until later on. I mean, I'd say the album, you, you, I think by the time I got involved, you were just beginning vocals, weren't you? So everything yeah. backing track wise was, was pretty much recorded. And I remember they sent me um, the album without vocals uh, and it had all the keys and everything on it. And I was just like, oh, where, where, where am I going to start with this? You know, <laughs> oh, there's vocals as well. Oh, no. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it, it's pretty uh, it's pretty daunting when you first hear a, a Dream Theatre album tracked and you think, right, we have to sort this out. And I was 
I'm like, oh, Jimmy's done a good job on this already. I'd just go with Jimmy's mix if I was you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so, but I've got to say, Jim made it so easy for me. The, the, the way the album's tracked, you know, some albums will get delivered and it's, it's more of a fix than a mix, you know, and this certainly wasn't that. It, it was a case of just, you know, just doing what I do with this stuff. So it, it certainly wasn't, it, it could have been a nightmare, but it certainly wasn't, you know. Absolutely. I mean, being in, being in a similar position where, you know, if I'm, if I'm mixing a project, you get, you get it sent to you and it kills a whole vibe if you're just lost, things aren't labeled. I mean, it's simple things, but it, but it's those small little things along the way that make it where you can digest it, especially something like a Dream Theater record. So being able to work on this record without any uh, real know-how of or, or real understanding of who was going to mix it, I tracked it as if I were to mix it. What yeah, do exactly. I want to see? And then you, when it goes to, to someone, yeah. yeah. How, how yeah it's like how you know you don't want to be ashamed with what you're delivering to someone else do you you know it's absolutely got to be organized. yeah uh, i actually don't do many albums where i don't mix them but i always you know as i go along i try and keep the whole thing um in some sort of semblance of order out so, you know if you come back to it four months later to mix it you, you, yeah. you could be in a real bad spot if you're trying to find files from different places and uh, you know trying to remember what takes were the right ones you know you've got to keep on top absolutely, of it absolutely yeah and especially with guys like uh the members of dream theater there's you have no other decision but to mix as you go because they're not gonna okay a performance if it's not translating like a record so yeah it's par for the course you know little bits of automation but then when that gets delivered over to andy even if things start to change, he understands what the conversation was in the room that this should sit back a little and, and then he can, you know, further indulge that. Yeah. So uh, I've obviously had the album for a little while, so I've heard it a lot. And I think this album is among the better sounding album that Dream Theater has ever made. And it's a real accomplishment because I think this album is also one of the most rhythmically heavy album like super focused on drums and heavy guitars and all that stuff how difficult is it to bring all that out and focus on every instrument and get the clarity out of that it's i mean it's it does take time um you, you know we went around the houses on, on this in in some respects where we we got a good balance mix you know it goes back to the band um you know, Mike, the drummer, was, was insistent on, you know, all the little cymbal parts and everything, which I'm fine with, actually. You know, you think, oh, he's, you know, you're driving Andy mad with, with some of this stuff. But I like I like to hear that sort of attention to detail on stuff. So it's if, if a drummer, for instance, has done this kind of thing and they don't feel they, they can hear it, the detail, then there's something not right. You know, so you want to go in and try and pull these details out um and, and you know get get the small details to the front of the mix so there was a point in playing it you know so there's a lot of little bits of automation that go in there riding the you know and it takes a long time um but i'm all about that and to me that's what a uh, a finished mix is you can blast through this stuff and get a you know an 80 percent mix where it's you know you're not it works, yeah, the yeah, yeah. yeah, but the vibe's good, you know, and that's kind of where you start off. You get, I always get the mix to that point where I feel it's a good, good balance. It's got power. It's got a vibe to it. And then we go from there, you know, the mix notes come back and you, you get the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, <laughs> 50 pages, you know, hi-hat at two minutes 30, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, but you, you you get there in the end and you go over all these things. And of course, every, you know, the, the, um, the, 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 the I'm, not, I'm not talking about Dream Theatre in general here, but you'll get the bass player, you know, never commenting on the hi-hat frequency or, or, or the drummer never commenting on the, uh, you know, the, um, the, the solo delay. It's always that everyone's listening to their own parts, you know, and that's a natural thing to do. So everyone's trying to pick their own little parts out. And, you know, for something like Dream Theatre, 
everyone knows exactly what they played. You know, they know the keyboard parts that they want to hear, or they know the, the like I say, the cymbal parts or the little tom parts they want to pop out the mix. And obviously John's got his little, you know, little runs that he wants to jump out the mix in places. So you really are going round and round and round on these songs. And there's so much detail in that, that you, you can sort of the mix starts doing this in the end, you know, one thing goes loud and that affects everything else. So it's a kind of, it's a case of digging things out with certain frequencies, you know, does the guitar need a, a tiny bit more mid just to make it pop a little bit more? Is the bass coming through, you know, can you feel the bass moving enough? So we, oh, I mean, we had endless, endless conversations, me and John going backwards and forwards on this stuff, um, just listening and listening and listening and driving ourselves nuts with it. But you get to a point where it's like, um, we're not really improving this anymore. It's got to a point where if something creeps up, it's going to damage something else. And then you have to sort of draw the line in the sand. And then you've got the mastering to sort out then, because that will change everything as well. So it's, you get to a point where we're not, this isn't accomplishing anything. We have to sort of step back and that's it now, you know? So I think we did walk away from it eventually going, does it sound any good? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I think it does. So I think we're okay. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, the guys in Dream Theater are not notorious of trying new instruments and new gadgets, especially, especially Jordan always brings in something new to the studio, I guess. And yeah, but the, you know, the, the thing I like about what Jordan does, each part um, has a reason for being there. I've mixed keyboards before where keyboard players have thrown stuff in because they, 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 they just think they should be playing something on this part and there's no real thought going into it, but... I think Jimmy will, will confirm that every sort of keyboard part he does, there's a reason. And, you know, the sound is tailored to that, that part as well. So yeah, it's, very, it's very well thought out. Yeah. We, um, we, spent, we spent a bit longer in uh, keyboard land um, this time around. And it's not to say we don't always spend time or Jordan spends time. But the funny thing about Jordan with these complex arrangements and, and parts is it's not the playing that's difficult for him to do. It's choosing the sound and layering it and, and the whole sound design aspect. He could play the most difficult line on the record, you know, unrehearsed with his eyes closed easily. But we had a lot of fun tools in here. Uh, he brought in his vintage Moog. We had, uh, we had a real Leslie with, the, with a Hammond driving it, uh, his Kronos, his laptop, just a bunch of different toys, the Moog One. And in tracking this record to essentially be building a mix in progress, I think the goal for me and Jordan was to make sure that the sounds he was putting down weren't to be carved out because he's put a big low end thing in something that's already derived of a bunch of low end material. So those were the conversations we were having along the way was how do you actually fit into this where the sound makes sense? Um, and sometimes that sound was made up of three, four different sounds. Uh, so, Keyboard submix, I felt like really mixed itself to work against the band on this record, where I have seen in the past that it could just be the whole kitchen sink. And then you're kind of like, I don't know what to do with this, except start pulling it apart. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember um, what, what I said to you, I, you know, it was kind of I, I mixed the, the basic tracks and then just sort of slotted the, the keyboards in like Jimmy had sent it over. And it really was sort of 80% there then, wasn't it? The, with, with the balances, it was just sort of fine tuning it around vocals and, and making guitars and keyboards balance out on solos and things like that, wasn't it? Uh, sure. Maybe a bit, a bit more presence on some sounds just to get it to pop out the mix a little bit more. Um, but it certainly wasn't like, just here you go, sort it out. It was, this is the sort of vision we've got. Um, roll with it from here, wasn't it? So, yeah. Yeah, which which was definitely uh, intentional. Um, and for Jordan, it's so important to make sure that his sounds serve a purpose and it's not just, you know, in the background. Um, so it was it was I think we blew past an additional two weeks of keyboard tracking just because we were really talking about every part um, in the beginning. Petrucci was here in the room alongside us making those decisions. And then he got into some lyric writing but that would actually worked out great because end of night he would come in 
and give that outside perspective and be like, uh, no, you guys kind of went the complete wrong way or this is perfect. So it was nice to have that chemistry in the studio uh, and also the leeway of time being that it's their own studio that we just decided to take longer. It wasn't as like rigid of a schedule. I think that's uh, a total, you know, that old school um, sort of watching the clock thing where, where you're at. Yeah. Your studio. I think that's the worst thing for creativity. I mean, it's the same thing here at my place. You know, when, when I get bands in, I'm, you know, if we need an extra week, it's just yeah. do it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't bill them or anything. It's I, I just rather everyone feels relaxed. You know, I've, I've, I've been an artist for too many years where I've been in paid studios where they're, they're counting every minute, they're charging you for every bit of gear that gets rolled into the room. And mm -hmm. it, it's just, um, it's just total, um, it's just a, a, a bus killer, isn't it? The whole thing. So you, oh, yeah. you want that, that thing of, right, we can just come and go as we want. If we need to pop out, get some fresh air, come back in an hour where we're, we're, we're coming back to it with a fresh head. Yeah. yeah. It makes such a difference. Really the, whole, the whole thing about creating a record is is the vibe has to be positive along the way. If it if it starts going sour, you'll never be happy with the end product. So that type of mentality kind of pays for itself, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's it's that thing where it, when you've been involved in an album, if it's been a tough album to make, um, it's a tough album to listen to afterwards, isn't it? Because you, you go back to that spot every time you listen to it. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, you, you want it to be a good experience. Definitely. I mean, I always try, you know, whenever I'm working with bands to be sort of, you know, upbeat and keeping, you know, even if you feel that there's a, a vibe within the band where it's not going too well, you try and find the positives and you try and find the, the strengths in people's play and, and, and focus it. That's your job as a producer, isn't it? So. Um, yeah, steering that ship and making sure it all happens pretty much on time and within budget, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, th this album also has the first uh, track from uh, Petrucci with an eight-string guitar, and that poises a whole new set of challenges, both recording-wise and mixing-wise. How did you face that challenge? Uh, starting on the tracking end, uh, we... So jump, jumping back a beat, uh, as Andy said, Andy mixed Terminal Velocity. And uh, that record we did in the DTHQ, John's head, John's usual uh, rig rundown, you know. And that head that we used for that record became the, the, the studio, JP2. And it wasn't touched, aside from, especially the graphic on, on a Mesa, the graphic is, is, if you breathe on it, the whole sound changes. Uh, he'd maybe toy with gain every once in a while, but generally speaking, the amps stay the same on Terminal, LTE, and DT15. More of the changes happened on how I recorded it, uh, what I printed up front, things like that. But when it came to the H string, he, we kind of just got into it, and it wasn't totally clicking. Like it, He was going for performance. He was getting used to it. As much as it was a... a learning curve i think for for me i don't know about you andy if you're dealing with a lot of h strings uh h string guitars but for john it was a learning experience as well getting comfortable and he had left the studio for the weekend we i think we recorded the first bit of rhythms on a friday i came in saturday just with it you know go looping in my head that it was something wasn't right and you might you probably know that feeling andy you go to sleep going like why oh, yeah. is this snare not cutting at that point you know yeah um I, i'm I unfortunate because i i actually live like above my studio so i'll, <laughs> I'll be i'll be in my dressing gown at four o'clock in the morning eqing you know because i can't sleep <laughs> it's a blessing and a curse yeah yeah, yeah yeah uh but i came in just like knowing i wasn't i wasn't okay with it yet um and Obviously, John has a few of his signature heads here. So I pulled out another, didn't want to touch the Holy Grail, and just got into a reamp mode because uh, I'm tracking a DI, clean DI, alongside his whole rig for these reasons. And uh, it must have been two and a half hours of just the same eight-bar loop going by. And I'm sitting there and you know just trying to get the amp to not look too different because I knew if I went too far, it wouldn't be his sound anymore. But to, to do that 
bark that the mason normally does, but compensate for the extra low end. What I found in the tracking process is because of the extra low end that the H string is going to give out, you really have to not be scared to, to pull that front end low end out driving the overdrive or driving the gain section of the amp because it just flubs out and the cabinet just doesn't sound tough it sounds yeah, I, I, and boring i always think with the the, the lower you go the, the more sort of mid-range note you're having to pull out because you know, you know you're going to these thicker strings which are you know if you visualize it they're sort of more rounded anyway and, and getting woollier and the, the you, you're losing the attack of the string so yeah it's a it's a little bit of a, you know, the bass fits in in a different area. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, uh, it's a whole different ball game, really. And it, you've got that almost um, that grind to the guitar that's lower. Um, yeah. So sometimes, you know, it's, I mean, I found it um, when I'm dealing with bands that are just tuned in 440 or, it, you know, it, you know, just regular sort of, rock guitars you can get away with even like the the regular 75 watt celestians where the 30 always suits anything that's slightly lower because it's got a different sort of edge to the mid-range and then when you start getting down to like the seven strings and the real low tuning you know everything's moving into the area where the bass guitar should be so you've got yeah. to try and find a, a diff, slightly different spot for the bass um and that it gets so low sometimes where it's just trying to pull the riff out and get the definition to those lower notes. Yeah. That's the yeah, yeah. So I, I, on that tune, uh, JMX is actually playing above JP on a lot of parts. He's a, he used a capo on the bass. It was a big conversation when they decided they were going to get in to write that song, which was the last song they wrote for the record. Um, and I think that's the Meshuga of, Approach. Well, yeah, it's the same octave for the the bass and the guitar, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. You may as well be playing the bass to the the guitar rig, haven't you? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, like JM didn't bring in something that would be at, lower than what he's already got. He actually yeah. was favoring a lot of the uh, the upper register to kind of define what the notes actually were. Yeah. It's it's a really good sounding track and it's new and uh, everything on the album is quite different uh, from what Dream Theater has done recently because it feels fresh and it feels like they've actually taken a bit more time to think things through uh, to make something uh, thought through, <laughs> I think is the right word. So I, I, have a, I, I have an oddball question for Andy, actually, talking about this tune. You okay. put a, uh, you put like a mega verb on the toms a couple times in that, in that song. Do you remember oh, yeah. what reverb that is? I loved it's it. Not, it's not, I've got a sample. It's, it's on the floor tom hit. Yeah, 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 yeah. What it is, I've got a sample, and I don't know where it came from, but it's called Lion King, of all things. <laughs> and it, it's, um, it, I use it, it's like a door slam sample. Um, and I use it whenever there's like a, a I, I use it probably on, on most albums I do, but it's just it's just great for that real and then it's like impact. Yeah, it's like an yeah. impact thing. Yeah. Well, so it's not an actual verb. It's an act, I'll send it. Yeah. It, it, but it's I great. love it. Yeah. It's just one of those things. Um, there's an old sort of I think it was on a on a D4 as well. There's like a tomb slam sample I used to use <laughs> as well. I've got a few of those sort of metallic um, sort of slam sort of hits. Yeah, sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the impact stuff. That's that's yeah. great. That's a good it, trick. You just sort of feel it, don't you? When you, you just want a bit more impact before the chorus hits or on, on, on a downbeat sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it's, I mean, especially on like a low floor tom, like what he's using, it's hard to get a verb tail to actually have like an audible sound and it not it's just not, muddy out. So the, the impact makes sense because it's got more mid-range probably. It's that almost that eighties sort of distorted verb thing, isn't it? That, yeah. That white, white, sort of white noise reverb thing. That... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Nice, nice. Now send that. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> so, so uh, speaking of uh, that, uh, w when you get a mix, Andy, or uh, the files from uh, Jimmy T. Uh, are there things you remove or add to it? 
uh, to make it pop out? Like, are there things, were there things that were, that were recorded that you just stripped out or stuff like that? Not on this, no. Oh, was there? Was there any keyboard bits that we took out? I don't think there was, was there on this? Um, I think there was one drum edit, I remember specifically in Invisible Monster. Mangini used to have like a hi-hat ticky thing and I think that was edited out. I noticed that, but oh yes, in the bridge uh, or something. Yeah, there, was, there was something where Mike said, "Oh, I, 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 it, that bit's wrong or something," but it had been played. Yeah, um, we did an edit on that. Um, but that was yeah. It was, you're right. There was like a an extra little hi hat flick or something, wasn't there? Um, but no, not on this. I mean, it's sometimes. Um, you know, if I, if I get sent a really sort of busy mix, you know, like we were talking about earlier, where, where everything's been thrown at it and not really the thought. I mean, there was thought put in behind this, but on, on someone else's album, um, I'll, I'll try taking a few things out and send it back as an example of sort of going, I think, you know, this sounds, because it will do it. It'll sound heavier for being more open. Um, and it's... You know, it's that creative approach where you're thinking it, 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 it has more of an effect to the next part because there's more of a dynamic in the song now. Um, on, on the Dream Theatre stuff, it, like I was saying, it, every part was had obviously been discussed and thought out, so it wasn't a case of having to take anything out on this. Um, as far as adding things in, uh, like Jim was saying, you know, a few effects and, you know, sort of vocal delays, I was, I was putting a few of those in. Um, some of them, the guys had already printed ideas in, into the mix sessions because there was ideas that they, they discussed and they wanted effects in certain places. Um, so it's, it's a bit of going backwards and forwards, really, isn't it? And saying, so, right, I hear this sort of thing here. What do you think? No. Yes. You know, it's, it's, it's a bit of teamwork when it comes to those sort of things. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this record and and you as a listener feeling like it has a certain strength. I think it just proves that all the conversations along the way from day one of writing to final approval of last master, like everything was a conversation. Everything was kind of put up on the chopping block to make sure we were making the right decisions in every department. So. Yeah. I, as I said, I really enjoyed uh, the album and the mix. It sounds really good. Uh, I've blasted it for months already so, and really abused my uh, sound system. Have you, uh, Jim, have you listened to it much since you finished it? Honestly, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's that uh, it, when you're that far in the rabbit hole, you know, yeah, like yeah. it's hard. It's it's hard. I'll I'll probably listen to it on release day or something. Yeah. You know, like get get back into it when it's readily available on a streaming service. I've got it yeah, on a Dropbox. You to, know, I have to walk away. I mean, I um even when like the the you know I'll I look on uh, online and the video has been done. I I can't listen to it. it it's you know especially when you you've, you've got it on your phone. And it, you know, it sounds so different. It's like, oh, I've got, I've got to go back. I've got to sort this out. <laughs> <laughs> it, drives, yeah. it absolutely drives you nuts, you know, doing this yeah. job because you put everything into it. And obviously you've gone around it so many times when you've mixed it. Um, and you come back to it six months later and you're like, why were we, why were we obsessed <laughs> with that? You know, the, you know, it, it, Oh, I want to push the guitars a bit more there, you know, so it really, you've got to walk away from it. And I'll probably listen to this in six months time when I've, <laughs> I've forgotten about all the little details and actually enjoy it. Um, yeah. But I have, I have to have some time away from it. As soon as I've, I've printed that final mix, it's down tools, walk away. And right, that's it. It's, it's a, it's a, I always say it about an album. It's a slice of time. It's where the band was at. It's where the equipment was at. It's where you were at as a producer, where you were at, were at as a mixer. Right. It's, and I think if you go back, um, it's like when you try and remix old stuff, it's kind of like you shouldn't really do that because it's, it's a different time, you know? Yeah, so, I agree. I agree. I, I think it, it, it's, that's what makes an album its own entity, isn't it? You know? Did, did you do the uh, surround mix as well? Yeah. Um, I mean, that was, 
you know, sort of going off the stereo mix and then, you know, putting it into 5.1 and putting things in certain places and trying to get a few bits of ear candy flying around. Um, I actually don't know what's happened to that. I don't know if... Uh, I think it's on the Blu-ray. Is it? Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know how many people will listen to that. So well, I've got a Dolby Atmos set up at home, wow. so uh, so I run my Apple TV, and that has the new spatial audio feature. And I yeah, gotta you're, say, you're one of the troublemakers, then, are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it actually does sound kind of different when you get the music mixed properly for Atmos, because then you can actually hear more of the ambience in the music. I think it, it's weird. I don't personally like it. I, I don't. Um, at the moment, I don't think it, it really suits music because to me, it's kind of, I, I always sort of visualize a band on stage when I'm mixing and it's sort of, that it's in front of you. I know, I know what people are trying to do with Atmos and, and Five One with creating the ambience around you and sort of a, a more of a depth to it. Um, but to me, I don't know, I, I think maybe it's just because I've, I've, it's been, stereo for so long you know <laughs> you're sort of used to a way of working but i'm, I'm not going to start paying for the 7.1 atmos system in, in my uh, my studio until a, another year and a half down the road <laughs> when you know it's taken off a little bit more i'm, I'm just wondering because it always it's always they move on to the next thing so quickly yeah, yeah, yeah. so we'll see but every, a lot of labels are asking for it now um there's always oh we, we want an atmos mix and i'm like no oh, there's the stems Go and find <laughs> I'm, I'm with you on it i when i listen to music i i listen on a stereo system yeah it's just where where my head's at and how i enjoy it but hats off to you for uh <laughs> for going down to the the uh surround studio and making it happen yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of you know where do you where do you want things because really um you know all you, all you can kind of do is put the the put the verb around you a little bit more and, and I find it almost destroys the mix that you were creating a little bit because you, you're forcing all this information into the stereo idea. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you've broken it all up and the, the compression isn't working the same. Things aren't feeding off each other the same. So it's a bit of a, you can hear yeah. things that are isolated a little bit more and it's not really, you know, you're not really wanting to hear it quite like that, but it adds a whole different feel to it. You know, it's like a chef. They, they, cook their meal they plate it exactly how they want it and then yeah. they put it on the table and they go okay now let's put all the vegetables on this little plate <laughs> yeah, steak over one. here yeah. <laughs> how does that taste yeah <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for joining me uh this this evening so all right let's go good talking sure, man. yeah absolutely yeah i'll catch up with you guys all right <laughs>